And so the title of tonight's message, if you're ready for it, is called Confronting the Strongholds of Your Heart. Confronting the Strongholds of Your Heart. You know, ultimately, here's the thing. The battle is, it's already been won. You've all, you're, you're sitting in church, you're, you're pursuing God. Uh, and if you, you haven't made a decision to know Jesus yet or accept or surrender, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have an opportunity in a few moments. But ultimately, the, the goal of the enemy is to win over or capture your heart. Why? Because he knows that if he holds your heart, he can control what you say, what you don't say, what you do, and what you don't do. And so I don't know about you, but when I was younger and in Bible college, I knew how to face it up right? Face it until you make it. Just start confessing, blab it and grab it, right? I mean, right? Doing all these things to appear that I've got it together. And I was taught, ignore the pain and project the face. But how many of you know that ultimately, if I'm going to live a healthy life, I've actually got to deal with the pain that's in my heart. And the enemy, what it, his goal is this, it's very simple. He wants, he's the ultimate heartbreaker. He wants to break your heart so that he can control and establish strongholds in your life. What is a stronghold? If, if, you know, some people define it as it's a stronghold on your mind, which is true. But I would like to say it like this. A stronghold is a mindset that is hopeless, that this circumstance cannot change. There's nothing I can do about it. So in other words, it's like this, it is what it is. How many of us have found ourselves saying, it is what it is? Ultimately, we are saying, right, and it's an outward decree of an inward condition of the heart of, I can't change anything, I'm, I'm powerless in this situation. So that actually reveals an area of potential stronghold with our heart that God actually wants to dismantle in your life, and I believe that could even be tonight. That's the very reason that Jesus came, friends, is to destroy the works of the enemy, to destroy the strongholds that have been erected in your heart through the, break, the heartbreaks of life. Now, the truth is that we've all had heartbreaks. There's none of us that has been exempt from experiencing heartbreaks. And if you have been exempt, please come see me after service and pray for me because I might need some healing from that. <laughs> Right? I mean, if, 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 we're, if we're really honest, then Jesus came not only to destroy the works of the devil, but he also came to heal every hurt. We don't have to hold on to the hurt, friends. Psalm 147, verse 3 says this, He heals the wounds of every shattered heart. He heals the wounds of every shattered heart. But if we refuse to surrender the pain to Jesus, then our only alternative is to turn away from Jesus and hold the pain. Right. Now, if we're really honest with ourselves, how many times have we found ourselves in the circumstances of life holding the pains of the past or the present because we don't know what to do with them? So we just learn to stuff the pains, but ultimately where I stuff, I actually open up the, the way for me to judge the situation and control this circumstance, which means I'm actually cooperating with the spirit of control. And we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. Are you ready for that? Now, let me tell you, let me say it like this, right? We, we all are, are passionate. We want to know what our purpose is. We want to know, like, how do, I, how do I practically build the kingdom of God? I'm here tonight to tell you, friends, the fastest way for you to build the kingdom of God and advance his territory is by you dealing and confronting with the strongholds in your own heart. If you want to move things forward... You want to move things across the line. You want to take territory. How many people, we want to roar. We want to take territory. Come on. Oh, so there's, it's this side. How about this side over here? Does anyone over here want to take, come on, come on. Right? If we want to take territory, then that means that we're actually going to have to take territory that starts with us. The greatest level of authority that you can carry, the greatest level of power that you're going to carry is going to come on the backside of you dealing with the junk in the trunk. <laughs> See, just a helpful phrase for us to, you know, identify, right? So here, here's the thing. 
Here's what I've found, the strongholds, and I'm gonna try to do this very condensely, the strongholds that I've found that's brought the most destruction to my life and, and, the, and to the lives of the people that I've encountered along the way. It's the strongholds of shame, fear, and control. You ready for this? And you can say, oh, I don't have any shame. Really? All right, hold on just one second. Let me, let's, let's go there. All right, Genesis 3. And we're going to read just a couple of verses, and we'll go from there. All right, so picking up verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were open, right? So they had, Adam and Eve, they had just messed everything up. They sinned, right? All the things. So then as soon as they, they, they did it, right, the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves coverings. And when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid, themselves from the, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And when the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? Meaning, I want to connect with you. Adam, I feel a disconnect. I want to reestablish our connection. I don't like being disconnected. He wasn't like, Adam, you're in trouble. Adam, you're going to go to hell. Adam, you're not good enough. That wasn't God's voice. God's voice was simply, where are you? Because I want to connect with you. I am more concerned about being connected to you than I am about the issues or about your shortcomings or your mistakes. So never allow the enemy to rob you of the connection that God has promised to you. So Adam responds back and he says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So here we see the entrance of shame, fear, and control. Now, when we look at the stronghold of shame, and just for the sake of time, I'm just going to jump right in into this. If we look at stronghold of shame, what is that? It's the feeling of low self-worth. Sink in for just a moment. A, A sense that there's something wrong with me. Right, Because something's wrong with me, I am not acceptable. Now, we may not say this out loud, and oftentimes we don't, but what are we thinking within our heart? What are we really feeling about ourselves? I'm damaged, right? We think of the past, and we think that there's an area of our life that's been damaged. Therefore, my value has been tainted. Or here's another huge one. Been seeing this everywhere that I go and ministering is that I am not qualified to speak. It's better for everyone if I just stay quiet. And I found that the enemy is after your voice. And why is the enemy after your voice? Because it's in your voice that the prophetic word of heaven is released, that releases life, that releases faith, that releases deliverance, that releases hope, that releases healing, that releases victory, that releases salvation. So if the enemy can shut your voice down, he can shut the prophetic flow of heaven. See, prophecy, friends, is not just for the prophet. Prophecy is for the believer to declare and decree the word of God. And so my question to you tonight is, where has your voice been shut down? Has it been shut down through the stronghold of shame? Because shame seeks to control, isolate, and silence you. And number one is actually, it's the the condemnation of, of our past failures and mistakes. See, when I got saved, uh, I, got, I got really saved, but I had a past that was a dirty past, <laughs> meaning I had nonsense, I had drunk, I had addictions, I had strongholds, I had broken relationships, I had all of the, can anyone relate to that, <laughs> right? So I came out of that environment, so when I got saved, I, I just really was just grateful that Jesus saved me, but then I was wrecked with condemnation of not knowing I was really saved, because I didn't know if I was really forgiven given. And there was an area, and there's a a couple of instances that I thought were, those were too bad. Those were too heavy. And because I had not ever shared that bad situations with anyone before, I felt that that the enemy really had a hold on me, contemning me and saying that I wasn't saved. Friends, I'm telling you, the first seven weeks that I was saved, I went to the altar to get saved every single week. But friends, you know, how many can relate? We got that mark. Mark, you did it too. Now, I'll tell you, I went to church on Wednesday, Wednesday night. I went to church on Friday night. I went to church. At, uh, these are all different churches because I was like, church is open. I'm there. I don't know what it's about. I just got to figure this thing out. Saturday, church is open. Sunday, I went to ch- two church services. And can I tell you, I got saved five or six times a week. 
and then the next week comes up. So you compound that, you know, over seven weeks. That's, that's called a lot of times that I got saved. <laughs> And I was just struggling with God, am I really saved? And I was tor- and I would go home every day thinking like, thank you God for forgiving me. But then the torment would set in and I would find myself in anguish of my soul thinking, God, why am I not forgiven? What do I need to do to make this right? How do I pay the price for my sin? I'm tired of carrying this. And I went to an altar finally on the like 52nd time. Something about 52 card pickup, maybe there's something there, I don't know. So there I am, and I'm just like, God, I don't know what to do. And I I just burst into tears with this minister. And she said, honey, your sin is removed from you. As far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed it from you. So quit condemning yourself because he condemns you. He has set you free. So friends, I'm here to tell you that if you have felt condemned, that is not from God. God says, as soon as you come to me, you are forgiven. I don't care what you did. You don't know what I did. I don't care what you did the week before. You don't know, right? Come on, like, let's be practical here. Don't make exceptions. Well, God forgives, accept. (laughs) No, God forgives. Now we have a process of restoration, but forgiveness is never the issue. Come on. Imposed on you through hurtful actions of others. Second way that, that, fear, that shame would come into your life. I remember I was in, uh, in junior high, and uh, how many know like image is pretty important when you're a junior higher? And uh, I, I grew up in a small beach town called Santa Cruz, California. How many Santa Cruz skateboarders, right? So, you know, like you, you kind of walk in, like you've got to kind of be a, you know, a tough person if you're going to be a surfer, if you're going to be a skater, if you're going to, and I was a skater, I wasn't a surfer. So in that, in that place, I had an inability to speak from what was really going on in my heart or what was physically going on with me. And so I wore, back in those days, I wore a, a, a headband and I wore a Chicago Bulls hoodie. I don't even know if you know one watches Chicago Bulls anymore, but back then that was like just the thing. So, and as I was wearing this headband, I began to develop this rat's nest in my hair. But I was too proud to be able, or too afraid, or too ashamed is actually the better term, of to be able to actually share it with my mom. So this went on for weeks. And then weeks actually turned into a couple of months. I got called into the even the counselor's office, like, Shelly, is everything okay? I'm like, no, I'm just cool. I don't need the right? So I was very defensive. Can we relate to that? We be, in the area in which we're, we're afraid to reveal becomes a place that we become very defensive and, and, and trying to conceal and not wanting it to be seen. So I, I'm living my broken, hidden life and trying to get around no one knowing and my mother not knowing and all these things. And then of course I'm in the, the quad and you have, you know, how many you know in junior high days then you also have mean girls. <laughs> and so there was the mean girls and they're like, oh, what, why are you wearing your hood? And why are you wearing your hood? All the things. So I'm sitting there one day, like minding my own business, trying to be cool, trying to stay hidden, trying to make sure no one sees me. And one of the mean girls decides, let's see what's under the hood. And she pulled down the hood and I was absolutely humiliated. And that caused me to feel even more shame in the situation that I was already feeling shame in. So it, it, it placed a imprint on my soul, if you will, of that, you know, I've got to hide. I can't let anyone know what's really going on on the inside of me. And so you fast forward or in conjunction with it. And, you know, I grew up in a, in a broken family and there's a lot of brokenness that was in the neighborhood that I was grew up around. And there was a lot of a abuse and every sense of the word of abuse. And so in my, my interpretation between both of those instances happening simultaneously, friends, was that I, it's my fault. I have to be quiet. I have to make the decision to conceal this and actually just to choose to be quiet and choose to project that I'm strong. How many of you can relate to that? Right? I mean, when, when we're really honest, there's certain areas of our lives that we've been shamed in that, okay, well, then the, the thing that do is to cover it. Shame will tell us, just as think of Adam and Eve, the scripture I just read. What did they do? They covered the shame of their nakedness. So shame will drive you to think that I need to cover the very thing that I feel would reject me. I was unable to speak about the abuse in those years because I was afraid that I would be rejected. I was afraid that people would make judgments. I was afraid that people would make fun of. I was afraid that people would say, you deserve it. 
And, and so those very words of condemnation, I turned to myself and embraced it into myself and not living a life that was free, but trying to live a life of, 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 of a projected or masked strength. Right? So then we, we end up covering who we, because here's the thing, shame kills and instills your identity. And it makes you feel like you have to actually confess something that you're not, be something that you're not. In, 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 actu- in actuality, what happens when shame comes in, I make a judgment. I cannot be myself. It's not safe to be myself. So it's better to be someone else. It's better to project what I think people would receive than to be the real me because if I'm the real me, people will judge me, people will shame me, they'll pull your, your hood down and expose the rat's tail that's on the, in, that's on the inside of your hair, right? Yeah. So then we end up putting on different masks, and one of those masks I would say is perfectionism. So our way of disguising who we really are, then we just get really good at being good. <laughs> But the problem is, is that when we live a life of, of perfection, have you ever noticed you can never achieve the standard that you've set for yourself? Like it's never good enough and it, you just, you're always disappointed in yourself? Why? Because it's a mask that you're not meant to carry. The truth is, is that God is not, requ- I, I, love, I, I believe this is Dr. Matt's phrase, it's, it, it, it's completion over perfection. It's more important about you completing something and stepping out and doing it than to be perfect in doing it. Because here's the thing. If you try to do something perfectly, you're never going to do it. You're never going to measure up to the standard because it's up here. But if you just step out, then God can work with you stepping out. So be set free tonight. You don't have to carry that. Next thing is would performance. We get locked into performance. I've got to earn my place at the table instead of knowing I have a place at the table. And so oftentimes we say, no, nah, I've already worked through performance. Really? Are you trying to earn your keep with God? Are you trying to earn your keep with your friends? Are you trying to earn your way into acceptance because ultimately you're, you're driven by fear of rejection? So then we try to perform our way through things. And this is a very real thing. I mean, come on, we, we've all worked through that. And, and, and the flip side of that goes into self-punishment. And we tell ourselves, you deserve this. You deserve to be isolated. You des- and you go into these things of, well, you misbehaved here, so therefore you should isolate yourself. You should step away from everyone. And then there becomes punishment. The, the, the extended, you know, the, the worst case scenario of that is people go into cutting. And what is that? That's, that's a, they say it's a pain relief, but ultimately it's self-punishment. Right? right? When, you, when you look at it, that's the, the grander scale of those things. Defensiveness, aggressive, being aggressive, right? Hyper-aggressiveness or hyper-defensiveness. All of these things, are under, they're basically a cover or, or a mask, right, to hide the shame that you're feeling. Now, the second stronghold is the stronghold of fear, the stronghold of fear is fear is not only a tormenting spirit, but it is a mindset that is driven by a spirit of fear. Right? And it's the same thing, right? It's because I was afraid that I hid myself. So what does fear do? Fear is about distorting your image and your imagination to frighten you in order to strip you of your faith and your courage to step out and to declare the word of God over your circumstance. So what does it do? Fear will pressure you to hide. Do you ever, do you ever find like during the book of miracles when you know that Dr. Matt might just call on anyone and you just start like, okay, I'm going to go to the bathroom real quick. Um, that's called that pressure is coming on you to get you to hide. See, I hear some laughs, which that means that some people are confessing right now. That's right. There's altar calls coming at the end. Right? Fear will silence you to be the, to be the real you. Fear creates a dread, a punishment. You ever get that? Here, here's, here's a good one. You ever get a phone call from your boss and immediately panic hits you? Your leader calls you and immediately, someone, like all of a sudden, it's like you just go into like, oh, what does he want? What's wrong? What is, you know, all the things. And you immediately go into defense mode. Uh, friends, that's called fear. <laughs> Fear will bring delusions to us that, that would cause us to distort situations that are imagined or, or worst case scenarios just immediately hit us. 
Like I remember, so my mom's a widow. She's been, she's been a widow now for about 11 years. So we have a routine. I call her and just check on her, see how she's doing. So I called her up and she didn't answer. I'm like, what the heck? Like, that's not like her. She always answers the phone. So me being the good daughter and very patient daughter I did, I waited about 30 seconds. And I called again, and I got no answer. And I, now I'm just like, all right, Shelly, like, just go, you know, go do something. And like, I'm walking around and just trying to think about it. Okay, now it's been a minute and a half. I called again. And then I waited about another minute and a half, and I called again. I waited another minute and a half, and I called again. So w within the course of, let's say, 20 minutes, I probably called her 20 times. <laughs> True confessions. I'll be also on the front row receiving ministry, right? And then the panic kid's like, okay, well, where is she? And she lives alone and the dogs are there. What if something happened? And you know, like all, the, like, all these things like run in like worst case scenario. So then I call up my sister-in-law who works not too far away from my, my mom. And is like, hey, can you go stop by mom's and see if she's okay? And she's like, Shelly, like, I, I don't have time for this. I'm like, what? She could be dead. She could be, you know, like I'm just going off. And she's just like, Shelly, I don't know, figure it out. And I'm just like, Nice, thanks. Thanks for helping out your mother-in-law. So then I reach out to the next cousin in the next city over, right? Because she's still not answering her phone. I'm like, hey, by any chance have you talked to my mom? And she's just like, no, but you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll try calling her. And I'm like, maybe she's mad at me and that's why she's not picking up the phone. Why don't you try calling and see if she'll answer the phone for you? Right, so I'm constructing this whole thing. Why? Because in my mind I see like her head face down in her fish tank and no one's there to help her. True, true story, true story, come on. I'm just keeping it real, fresh, real, and powerful, come on, come on. Pastor Sam said he's gonna pray for me after service, get me delivered, so I'm looking forward to that. And uh, wouldn't you know, my mom got home, she called me up, she's like, Shelly, my phone was dead. Like, I just didn't bring it because the battery was dead. And I'm like, what the, like, I, I created this whole story. So that is what fear will do. The results of yielding the fear, if you, if you really let, we try to manage the pressure by controlling things and people around us. Reminds me of, a, of another time that it was a few years ago, we were loving on some people at church and unfortunately they had some piojos, or also known as lice. And so I got jumped by some lice and, and then I thank God had the piojos police that came and helped me out and cleaned me out and all the things and get rid of the lice. Now you're all gonna be scratching your heads in just a moment. It's usually what happens whenever we mention lice. And, and, and I was so like ticked that I had lice. Come on. Like I take showers, like I wash my hair, I change my clothes, like right, all these things are going through my mind. So then I didn't know what to do with, are they there, are they not there? Cause you can't really tell, is, is the eggs there? Like, right, so I'm being tormented by the light. So then what do I do? I grab the vacuum and I'm just like vacuuming away, stripping down the str streets. I'm trying to do all these things, cleaning. Why? Cause ultimately I wanted to control the situation so that I would feel safe. So when fear is gripping you, you end up defaulting to control in order to feel safe. And then we end up with a bigger problem, which is called the stronghold of control. Stronghold of control. In my last few moments, and see if we can land this thing. And so I hid, just as they said, right? I hid myself, right? Which is a means of controlling to ensure safety. So people are not controlling because they wanna just be jerks. People are controlling because they have a need to feel safe. So we, because we usually think of it like, gosh, like that's such a controlling person, like so bad. It's like, really? How about the control in your own life? How about where you've said yes to control to feel safe? And here's the thing. Number one, spirit of control uses fear to get you to agree with a mute spirit to shut down your voice. Silence is a way of living shut down, giving up, hanging the flag and saying, I give up and living a passive life. Wow. So wherever there's passivity in your life, the spirit of control has shut down your voice. Wow. This shut down, why? And then you don't have authority to speak in that area. You have shame around that area. And then it's fear that energizes that area of your life that makes you feel unable to actually break out. 
to actually say anything. And so then we live under a, an agreement of silency and we never give that thing voice that then just ends up keeping us enslaved and passive in that area and living a hidden life and people not seeing who we truly are because we're afraid that if people saw who we truly are, that they would judge us. So my question to you tonight is, what area has, in your life has a mute spirit taken hold of your voice? Where have you lost courage to speak? Maybe you're like, I don't know. Well, where have you, where were you used to speak that you're no longer speaking now? What were you able to say before that you're currently struggling? Like you're here, you're in men's prayer, you're in cherished prayer, you're doing all the things and you're in a great environment that is an insulator in your life, but what's happening on the inside that we've got to tackle, right? The strongholds of the heart. In other words, we've got to confront the strongholds of the heart and quit tolerating passivity. Quit tolerating a mute spirit that causes you to come under a spirit of control, holding you down. Here to help you out. Here's the thing, because control will conf tries to get you to co be conformed to it, to agree with it. And you know, here's the thing that really like turned the light bulb for me, like, oh shoot, like I'm going after control because I don't want it near me. I don't want, because if I yield to control, then guess whose nature I begin to reflect? Oh, ouch. That means I'm no longer able to reflect the nature of God. I'm actually re relating and reflecting a nature of a controlling spirit. Mama Mia, I was just like so like, God, get the control out of my life. I don't want to, I come out of agreement with control. I break agreement with fear. I break agreement with shame. And I believe that God has sent me here by divine assignment to expose the strongholds that have hold, held us down so that we can walk in victory because this is a campus and this is a region and this is a church that is meant to have a roar. This is a church that is meant to have a prophetic decree. This is a church that is meant to have its sons and daughters prophesying and declaring wholeness, wellness, and salvation, healing, restoration, freedom, them, casting out devils, healing the sick. Come on. That's not just the person in the platform, but that's you and where you're at. You are called to actually dislodge the enemy out of people's lives. It's not just a freedom night. This is the, we're a freedom living people, which means we live in freedom. We go and we walk out in freedom. So we've got to expose, okay, well, what are the, the, the tools of control? And we know, right, there's, there's codependency, which seems like it's right. Like I always used to think that the, the, the people in my world, that they were the codependent ones because I was the one who needed to rescue them. But I didn't realize that I was the codependent one because I needed them to need me. So we look at it the other way. Ah, oh, she's so controlling. Ah, oh, she's so, you know, codependent. And you just got to cut off that. Really? Why do you need to rescue? <laughs> that's, that's called, you are also codependent. And when I realized that, it's like, man, the light bulb just went on of like, why do I need to be needed in a distorted way? Like we're all called to help, but that's in a distorted way. Manipulation's the same way, right? We, we know that manipulation, anger, all of these things, the, the goal is to control the circumstance, right? You ever notice like husbands and wives, like husbands, sometimes you know, and this can be vice versa, that you know your wife's mad and she never said anything. She's in the kitchen and she's slamming things and like chopping the, you know, the onions and the carrots really loud. And you're like, ooh, I'm gonna go in my man cave. <laughs> Right, I know where to exit, right? Or vice versa, your, your husband's out in the garage and he's just slamming things and he's making things known and slamming doors, right? Got some married people getting a little squirmy here. <sighs> Altar call right now, all married couples come forward. <laughs> Right, marriage retreat coming up. I don't know if there's any space, but get there if you if you haven't signed up. Definitely, it's coming up next month. Right, get, th those are all things, behaviors that control in order to feel safe. And that's what anger does. We it's 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 based on that. So so Shelly, great, you revealed all this stuff to us. Now what? Well, now it's time to deal with it. Let's get free. Right. So one, it's seeing it. 
One is seeing it. Two is repenting where we've come into an agreement with it. Three, it's renouncing and saying, this is no longer a part of me. I break my agreement with this. And then four, expecting that freedom would come your way. And I don't care if this is your first freedom experience or if this is your hundred or your thousandth or your five thousand, whatever it is, whatever it takes, whatever the cost, I am going to confront the strongholds of my heart because I want to live a free life. I want to live a free life. I want to live a life that is free, that is whole, and God desires for you to live a free life. Now, if you would, would you all just stand to your feet? I know that there's going to be some in this room that says, well, you know, I, I, I've known of God, I've, I, I've been around God, but I've never surrendered my life. Or, or maybe one time in your life that you surrendered to God, but maybe just as the circumstances of life where you felt beat down, you felt smacked down, and you, you're like, man, I just feel just a distance or a disconnect between me and God. And God is here to say, I want to set you free. I want to connect with you. Anyone in this room, just would you just take a moment. Every, every eye that would be closed. How many of you would say, I need to take that first step of freedom. I need to get right with Jesus. I need to surrender my life to Jesus. Can I, on three, one, two, three, lift up your hands all over this room. Come on. I see hands all over this room. I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand up there. Thank you for that hand up there. I see your hand. Thank you for the hand. I see your hand, sir. Thank you for that hand. I see your hand. Thank you for that hand. There's hands all over this place that is raised. You're taking your first step to freedom. Well, let's all say this with them. We're going to pray a prayer and Jesus is going to transform your life here and now. And you're not going to have to be like me running to the altar 52 times to know that you're saved. You can know the first time that you are saved. Amen? Amen. All right. Say, say this with me. Jesus, I want your freedom. Jesus, I, want your freedom. I turn from my ways. I turn from I turn to your ways. Save me and set me free. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. And I command the devil to get off of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Now, how many of you would say one of those three areas, like, Maybe, yes, you've struggled, or may, it's a current struggle right now. Like, man, there's an element of shame. There's an element of fear that's been gripping my heart that I've been struggling with. There's, a, there's an element of control. If that's you, would you just be bold enough to lift up your hands all over this room? Come on. I mean, come on. The truth is I can... Y'all heard my crazy story with my mama. I need prayer too, right? So here's, here's what we're going to do. I want you to take another step of faith, and I want you to come out of your seats, and I want you to fill this. Make, let's make this an, a mosh pit altar. Come forward. Come forward. Come forward, all of you. Come forward. Our ministry team's ready. We're going to lead you in a time of prayer. This is your moment where everything changes. This is your moment where it's, it's not about the neighbors around you. And I know it's gonna look a little bit messy because everybody's in this room and everyone's all over the place. Don't worry about that. I want you to, you're, you come out of your seat and you're saying, Jesus, I am tired of living with shame. Jesus, I'm tired of living with fear. Jesus, I'm tired of being shut down. I'm gonna get my voice back. And maybe some of you, you're stepping forward and you're saying, I want my voice back. I break agreement with control. I break agreement with fear. I break agreement with intimidation. Jesus is here to set you free. And, I, and you're saying, man, I can't get into the front. Maybe it's just better for me to get in the back. I just want you to step out of your seat, get in a place and get into a position where you can say, God, I'm in a position to be set free tonight. I'm not going to let anything hold me back. I'm not going to let anything hold me back. I'm not going to let anything hold me back. I want to be set free. I'm tired of living with shame. I'm tired of living with fear. I'm tired of living with control. I'm not going to reflect the nature of control. That's, that's gross. I don't want to do that. I want to live in freedom. Thank you. Thank you for your humility. Thank you for coming out of your seats. And I want you, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to lead us all in a corporate prayer. Our ministry team is scattered throughout this room. You don't have to worry about going to them because they're going to come to you. And while you are waiting, after we pray, the music team is going to usher us in 
to you a song that I want you to engage your heart with while you're waiting for someone to minister to you. Just as I literally locked eyes with Mike when he shook his head at me like, I can't believe you're coming forward, Shelly, again, but I can. And then he starts laughing, I start laughing, I got completely set free. So ultimately it's not about like, oh, it's gotta be this or that, just whatever way that God wants to bring it, whatever touch that he wants to bring to you tonight. Don't make predetermined nations of how it's supposed to go, right? All right, you ready? Repeat after me. Father, I come to you right now. I submit every area of my life to you. I repent of any shame, any sin of shame, any sin of fear, and control that is to govern my life. I repent for yielding to fear, to shame, and to control. I renounce my need, my desire to control others. I say it's no longer a part of me. I do not control others. I choose to set them free. I declare you are my protector. I break my agreement with every spirit of shame, of fear, of rejection, and control. I command them to leave my life right now in Jesus' name. I break your hold off of my life and my family, and I command you, I order you to get out of my life, get out of my heart. I receive the healing power of Jesus Christ right now in Jesus' name. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.